Hello, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us from wherever you are. We're coming to you live from our studios here in Kukumlimle on digital address GAA 0992539. Our leading stories this hour. Five people dead from suspected waterborne diseases in East Mampusi municipality in the northeast region of Ghana. Last year, it wasn't like this. We didn't even, they were having it within themselves. Those who went to have that kind of diagnosis, they were having it to their, themselves. Just this year that it increased and the number has increased. Therefore, they can't hide it again. We'll hear from residents worried about the rapid spread of the disease in their community. 23-year-old arrested for attempting to sacrifice his nephew for money rituals. Ashanti Regional Security Coordinator takes on police for releasing some members of the Delta Force Vigilante Group who forcefully removed him from office. Why don't you join us on DSTV Channel 421, Go TV Channel 144 and on YouTube where we stream live. Join us with your opinions on 0540-10-9009. Let's get started. Now, at least five people are dead from a suspected waterborne disease which has hit Bumbua Ziu community in the East Mampusi municipality of the Northeast region. The disease is said to be spreading rapidly in the community as dozens of the residents have been infected with at least five dead so far. Uh, and about the same number in critical condition. It is still not clear the type of disease, but health officials say those infected were found to have problems with their intestines. Correspondent Ilyasu Tanku has been learning more. Seven-year-old Fatima Musa is one of the victims of this suspected waterborne disease. She returned from the Nalirgo Baptist Medical Center weeks ago after a successful intestinal surgery, and her parents say she is in stable condition. Bima didn't that pillow or a chin who caught you till a whole pasia. Bana. It started with her suddenly vomiting a yellowish liquid. It was so severe that at the point she could not stand on her feet by herself. We rushed her to the facility at Langvinsi and we were referred to the Baptist Medical Center in Nalirgu. As soon as we arrived, she was taken to see a doctor who examined her and said she drank a contaminated water. So the doctor told us to inform our assemblyman about the situation. This six-year-old girl, Brukaya Musa, is another victim in the community, also discharged from the Nalirgo Hospital days ago. Her mother, Aisha Tumusa, who was with her at the hospital, spoke to Joy News. They put a tube through her stomach and brought out lots of yellowish liquid before the surgery. The doctor then told me that the water we drink in our community is harmful. Joy News in the community gathered that about five people so far are believed to have died from the disease since 2019. Yahaya Tani is a wife to one of the diseased patients, an 80-year-old man who died last month. He was complaining of stomach pain and was vomiting as well. So the children took him to hospital, but he died there. The outbreak area is the community of Bumbazio, a farming settlement of about 1,000 people located near Tlangbinsi in the East Mamprosi municipality. With no good road, electricity, health pools, water and sanitation infrastructure, the people are in desperate need of basic amenities. The community has two main water sources, a stream that runs at the outskirts of the community and two boreholes. A third borehole facility which was to be constructed by this NGO has since been abandoned. However, people rely on the water from the stream due to all the time very long queues to the borehole water. 
This pregnant woman has just walked past a borehole heading to collect water from the stream. Because the pipe water is not enough for all of us. We are suffering a lot to get water to drink. We are always at the hospital as our case, husbands and relatives are getting sick. We are pleading with the government to give us good drinking water, else all of us will die soon. At the stream, dozens more women have abandoned the boreholes and were here with their young girls to collect the water. Kasim Amina is a teenage mother claiming to have lost one of her twins to the waterborne disease a few weeks ago. The doctor told me the water we drink is contaminated. She wants authorities to come to their aid with clean drinking water. It is still not clear what could have contaminated the water leading to the deadly outbreak. But Joy News found evidence of open defecation and other insanitary activities of the residents along the stream. We need the pipes to be situated at the back of our houses. We need it urgently to prevent further death. The assemblyman for the area, Bukhari Baba, said he has filed a formal report inviting authorities at the Eastman Prince Municipal Assembly to investigate the outbreak. The case really, really escalated this year. Last year it wasn't like this. We didn't even, they were having it within themselves. Those who went to have that kind of diagnosis, they were having it to their, themselves. Just this year that it increased and the number has increased. Therefore, they can't hide it again. From what they are saying now, we have more than 15 or 20 people who have uh, diagnosed the same sickness. Uh, the one who went the last two years, that was 2019, he died. Uh, one also uh, said uh, the child died. One child is just by my, uh, at the back of my house. He also died. They sent him two days and then they diagnosed the, the, that the sickness, the sickness was from the intestines and he died before they could do the, uh, the operation. So how many people have died? They are, they are about five. five. One immediate thing I think they should do is to come and then test the water. If really the sickness is from the water, then the second backup uh, or they will give us a, a backup system like getting us a ball who Ilyasu Tanko <laughs> reported. A <laughs> report there from Ilyasu Tanko. Now a 23 year old fashion designer Benjamin Ajay has been charged with preparation to commit crime to wit murder. This follows his arrest on Saturday by the Abyssin police for an alleged attempt to use his 13 year old nephew Listowel Ajay for money rituals. The police, upon a tip-off, laid ambush at Tanoso Barrier on the Sunyane Kumasi Road and arrested the suspect with his nephew together with a handbag containing one big cutlass, a knife, red calico, one big pot, a quantity of cola nuts, cowries and 300 Ghana cities. According to the police, the suspect, who has been arraigned, confessed to the crime upon interrogation. Let's go on to Zoom now and speak with Bono correspondent Precious Semevor and learn more. Precious, how exactly did this uh, come to the attention of the police? Yeah, so, Bojo, the police got wind of this uh, through an informant. Uh, now, this informant uh, lives uh, within the same uh, vicinity. And apparently, this Benjamin, a gay guy, has seen the informant as someone who is doing well in his business. So he seems to have thought that the man may have uh, gone through money ritual uh, to have the work that he having. So he contacted this man via phone. In fact, uh, most of their conversations uh, were uh, recorded and I had the opportunity to listen to some of them uh, where he pleaded for the man to accept him uh, to get money through rituals because he has tried about three times uh, with some Malans and other people and he realized that they are all fixed and uh, he wants the man to accept him 
and that he's ready to do everything humanly possible uh, to get rich. Hmm. Yes, we're, yes, we're following. Can you hear me? Yes, precious, we can hear you. Uh, please continue. Right, it seems we have some difficulty with the connection there. Um, but we do need to bring you the rest of this story. Um, a 23-year-old arrested for attempting to sacrifice his nephew for money rituals. This, uh, of course, came to the attention of the police after a tip-off, which led them to um, uh, intercept the suspect at the Tanoso uh, police checkpoint, at which point they discovered that he was traveling with um, this said nephew. Let's see if we can uh, connect with uh, Precious Semivor now. Precious, can you hear us? Precious, uh, do we have you on the line? All right. Well, um, uh, we can now hear from the police uh, who have been looking into this matter. In the case, in a situation where somebody a suspect by name Benjamin Ajay, 23, fashion designer, made preparations to go and then use his nephew, Lestro Ajay, 13 years, to offer a sacrifice in order for him to get rich overnight. We've had this information through an informant barely two weeks ago. On the 14th of this month, we had concrete information that the suspect was ready to embark on that exercise. Then police together with the informant laid ambush on the 15th of this month. Police laid ambush at Tanosu Beria. Already police had had enough information from the informant as to how he was conveying the victim to the place. And then the suspect was relying on the informant to lead him to a Juju man's place. Police got ambushed at Tanaso Barrier, got suspect Benjamin again arrested in a taxi cab, found Lister Welege, the nephew, also on board. The police arrested them, all of them, took them to the police station. A search on the car revealed a handbag containing a big atlas, a knife, quantity of cola nuts, red calico, one big pot, cowries, and money sum of 300 Ghana cities. Police posed more interrogated the suspect. Suspect did admit that he was really going to offer the nephew for sacrifice in order to get money. Police, as we speak now, to preparing the accused person to arraign him before court on a charge of preparation to commit crime to wait murder. So, and how is the family reacting to this? The family, to the best of my knowledge, is cooperating because they were taken aback when they realized a relative, that is the suspect Benjamin Ajay, had had that plan and he wanted to execute that plan. So they were, they were really astonished and cooperating with the police to ensure that the suspect is prosecuted. But information that uh, we have indicated that they are trying to get in touch with the police to uh, release the case to them so that they handle it at the family level. Well, to the best of my knowledge, I'm not aware of that situation. I'm in charge the case. And uh, I think that this is a situation where a relative was going to be offered for sacrifice. And any rational human being wouldn't take such a thing lightly. They are cooperating as we speak. They are cooperating very well as we speak. And as I speak right now, suspect is being arraigned before court. And then the police would not budge. The police in no way would compromise this situation because this is a case of first degree felony. That is a murder. And then even 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 that the, the complaint the family of the victim, even if they don't see eye to eye with police, they have no choice because this is a crime against the state. It's against the republic. And police will no way agree with them 
to toe that line. Right, I think we can reconnect with Precious Semevor now and learn uh, the rest of the details there. Uh, Precious, you were in the middle of explaining how this all came to be. Uh, so apparently, uh, all of the phone conversations were recorded between the suspect and the whistleblower. Yes, yeah, so the, the informant, you know, all this were, was in charge with the, the police. Uh, they are the same uh, station officer, and he constantly briefed the man about the motive of this uh, Benjamin A. J. guy. And uh, they uh, assisted him as to how to uh, play along. And eventually, uh, he got uh, arrested uh, when, uh, on the final day, he was supposed to have uh, brought all the items that we bought together with the money, and then the child uh, or the 13 year old boy uh, to a, a particular location so that they continue their journey to where the ritual is expected uh, to have taken place. So that led to uh, his arrest. But as to how he got away from the house with the boy, uh, apparently he told the family that uh, he had returned from Kumasi uh, because he's a fashion designer and he had something uh, by way of cloth for the boy. So because he's a relative, uh, he's an uncle to the boy, they just allowed uh, him to take him away, and uh, that would have been the end uh, of the boy. But so, you know, if you can hear me, as we understand now, he has been arraigned before court. He has been remanded uh, in police custody for two weeks to reappear on the second of uh, this, uh, this uh, that is uh, June next month uh, to reappear. Mm. Well, we'll certainly be following this one keenly. Uh, so, Precious, thank you very much for that update. Uh, we'll have more from you as it unfolds. Now, there are calls for urgent steps to end avoidable deaths in the Ghana healthcare system. A 12-year-old boy over the weekend lost his life at the Bator Catholic Clinic after his parents were unable to secure a bed and ensure his transfer to a major health facility here in Accra for urgent medical attention. It took hours to secure an ambulance and even longer for paramedics to confirm the availability of a bed here in Accra to enable the journey to commence from the Volta region. Uh, well, that journey never took off. There's more in this worrying uh, report. Member of Parliament for Ningo Pram Pram, Sam George, first shared the story on social media. He recounts the deceased 12 years old Henry Nete had been referred from the Bato Catholic Hospital to the Kolibu Teaching Hospital but couldn't be admitted due to the lack of beds. According to Sam George, eventually, when 37 Military Hospital agreed to admit him, the ambulance refused to move from Bato without a confirmation from the hospital in Accra. Father of the deceased, Michael Nettie tells Joy News his son died after five hours of struggling to first gain admission and then get a medical transport to Accra. We did everything possible, everything possible. Around 8.13 there, about where the ambulance, we finally got in the agreement from the ambulance that they, would be with you, they are ready to go with us. Establishing the call to set seven again became another wahala. So it is just a mere failure on the system that has led to the loss of if. That is not even the main problem. I would say that has caused the loss of, of, of the uh, uh, life. It's just unfortunate, and I don't know. I don't know. Michael Nettie wants government to remove challenges affecting health care delivery in the country. Why must it be that a call to national, uh, nationals for it to be directed to region, to region to whatsoever? What, uh, one official just told me that, look, the ambulance is parked to the ne next to his house in, in, uh, uh, at Bato. The constituency ambulance is parked next to his house at Bato. Why can't we even decentralize this, this uh, deployment of the ambulance? Why can't the district manage that thing? Member of Parliament for North Tong, Samuel Kujetu Ablakwa, is of the opinion a ban on government appointees seeking medical treatment abroad will compel government to fix the problems facing the health sector. Why can't we have a health system that works for all, regardless of status, size of pocket, who you know, or who knows you? This cannot be normal, and we cannot accept this. The challenges in our broken healthcare system must not be allowed to fester. Some of the challenges are so basic that we have absolutely no excuse. 
I recall my surprise when I discovered some six years ago that the Bator Catholic Hospital had no incubators at its pediatric ward. I immediately provided two. I recently donated another incubator to the Akuse Government Hospital in the Eastern Region when I found out that they had none for over seven decades. There is the need to implement a policy of no medical treatment abroad for members of the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary with immediate effect. This appears to me to be the best way to address the numerous challenges in the health sector. This will force us to get things right and do right to avoid the needless death of the 12-year-old which continues to traumatize me. It may be recalled that the issue of unavailability of beds came up strongly for discussion in June 2018 when a 70-year-old man died after his family carried him to as many as seven major hospitals in Accra but couldn't be admitted to any of them. Uh, the Ghana Health Service then directed that the lack of beds should not be a basis for patients to be turned away from hospitals. The Ghana Ambulance Service says its delay in transporting the 12-year-old boy from Bator is not contrary to the health service directive since it was a referral case and not a patient to hospital transfer. Professor Ahmed Zakaria is the CEO of the ambulance service. Directive, it's already been obeyed because that's why the patient is receiving care already at Bator Government Hospital. The patient has received some amount of care up to a point where he needs to be moved to another facility. That arrangement then falls under the referral system. And that referral policy, as part of the gatekeeper system, is such that before they move, they must establish that there is a bed available at the next facility. Because of what use will it be, a patient is already on a bed, is moved to go and is put on the floor, on the stretcher, on a, um, a chair. Because that facility, the, the idea about making sure everybody receives care. You remember that even encouraged people to be to be um, nursed in wheelchair in wheelchairs, sometimes in ordinary chairs, plastic chairs. But you cannot take a very critically ill patient and go to a facility where the beds are full and you have to nurse the patient in a wheelchair. That's the point I'm talking about. Now, the Ghana Medical Association is calling for reforms to ensure a digital platform that enables hospitals to communicate with each other on transfer of parent, uh, patients forgive me, as against requiring paramedics and hospital staff to make calls to confirm bed space. Dr. Titus Bayo is the Deputy General Secretary of the Association. How must it depend on us calling one doctor and another? When that administrative directive was given, some of us said just a directive without any backing system will fall flat on its face. And this is what we are seeing. Why don't we have a system? Why can we not have a system where the hospitals talk to each other on a system that if you need to move a patient right on the system, you can tell what is happening. So just call IT students from even secondary schools and give them a, 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 a competition to develop a robust system that can help inter-hospital management of beds and referral systems. And in a week, this solution will be solved, and the problem will be solved. You're watching The Pulse. Still to come, Ashanti Regional Security Coordinator takes on police for releasing some members of the Delta Force vigilante group who forcefully removed him from office. We'll analyze that when we return. You welcome back. Now let's go to Kumasi where the Ashanti Regional Security Coordinator, DCOP Ayinso Pariado, retired, has taken on the police there for releasing some members of the Delta Force Vigilante Group who forcefully removed him from office. Last week, members of the NPP Vigilante Group stormed DCOP Opare Ado's office to remove him, claiming they were acting on orders from above. Although the police arrested the Delta Force members, they released them almost immediately. DCOP Ayinsua Pariado has been sharing his ordeal with MFAPO in an interview on the Midday News. ...to the office about um, 5 p.m. and said that um, they've been directed to bring me to the 
uh, national security coordinator. I said, I will go. So they handcuffed me, pushed me here and there. And uh, the police came in, pointed uh, an AK-47 at me. The police came there and picked us to the uh, regional police headquarters. The case is under investigation with the police. But unfortunately, they haven't got the seven persons who came to my office to humiliate me in this way and assault me in this way. Now they told me the acting national security coordinator had asked them to come to pick me to Accra. And I said it was quite unfortunate. I won't go to Accra. They handcuffed me. My, uh, they locked the door, took the key. Even the key is still with them. They locked the door, took the key, and uh, took all my phones, three of them, and that of the secretary, and started asking questions. And uh, after that, uh, they handcuffed me and said they were taking me to Accra. And I said, no, I won't go. So we started struggling. <laughs> and they pointed an AK-47 at me that I will go with them, regardless of what I say. Have you been updated exactly on, on what it is that is going on? Well, I haven't asked the police about anything again. Uh, certainly, uh, I'll go to the police and find out what developments are. I was working with them. They wanted to do, um, say they will go and collect money from people, and people will be calling me, telling me uh, they've come to collect this uh, that amount. And even uh, the Israel FM did a program where uh, Mustafa, one of them called staff, will be going to those who had brought items uh, from Nigeria and say that uh, and the uh, Central Regional Security Coordinator says you should give him money and you take 10,000 from them, bring them to me, uh, that he's bringing them that money to me and I never did send him anywhere. So I informed one of them who, who is supposed to be uh, the uh, leader of the Delta uh, Force Group that this is what your man is doing. It's been broadcast on uh, what is your FM. So tell him, I want to see him. Now those guys came to me and said they were afraid I should let him go. So I want him, he came and knelt before me in the office in the presence of uh, Mohammed Saidu. And from that time, I told them, no, if this is the behavior you want to put up, the president said he is not interested in that I'm saying the other things that are happening. So I can. Hmm. Let's have a conversation about this. Uh, joining us on Zoom is Adam Bonner. He's a security analyst. Uh, Mr. Bonner, thank you for your time. Delta Force again. Uh, does this come to you as a surprise, even though this group is supposed to have been disbanded? You know, it doesn't. Good afternoon, Kojo, and to your viewers. No, it doesn't. It doesn't come to me as a surprise. Uh, the same way DSP Azugu and the other guys at National Security Ministry or Secretariat don't come to me as a surprise, even though there was a clear recommendation to, you know, get these people redeployed or reassigned away from the National Security Secretariatal Ministry. And you see, any time these guys go to do, perform such, call it reprehensible acts, uh, they claim to be national security. It is because uh, we still have the op operational units of the national security, which is not an army, which is not part of the army, which is not part of the police. So these are people who really don't fall under the remit of any law. They do as they want. Anyone who understands uh, policing will tell you that the the, the gentleman, the, the, uh, the former, I don't know if he's a former security coordinator for Ashanti region, he retired at the rank of the deputy commissioner of police. And if you know, such persons, even when they get it wrong, whilst they are in service, usually they don't even sack them. These are not people you would handcuff. 
At his age and the rank he attained before retiring from the Ghana police, uh, these people at least should have accorded him that respect. But they went in there, cocked an AK-47 according to him, at him, and said whether he wanted, he liked it or not, they would drag him. It tells you that, and I have said it very clear, loud and clear, and let me put it on your network, that if we don't straighten up or get rid of the operational unit of the national security, these guys one day, we will see a similar thing that happened in Nigeria, in Ghana, the end SARS movement that threw Nigeria into some ungovernable state. We will see it here because they they don't, who, who instructs them? They don't. If they, they could actually buzz into your studio, join your TV room and, and decide to detain everybody and probably do things and no one would talk. And for me, this is where we've got into 21st century Ghana. One is expecting that under, uh, you know, a, a human rights activist lawyer, uh, you know, uh, president, Nanado, these things shouldn't be happening. This operational unit was put together under uh, Jerry John Rawlings because of the background of coming from a military rule into a civilian rule. This should have been gotten rid of by our president. And I think that uh, the narration, if it's anything to go by, it means that all of us are tricks. You know what happened to your, you know, your colleagues at City TV, I mean, City Group. It means that no one is in control. They were, these national security officials were in the Western region, somewhere in Asankregua, to destroy a lot of stuff in some, some two casinos. And no one seems to be in control. So it is, it is that bad. It's, it's so bad. If we are not careful, they will throw this country into some civil unrest. These guys who are parading as, you know, national security. And it is not all of them. If you say the national security, we have the research unit. I mean, now we have the BNI, which is NIB, the National you know, Intelligence Bureau. They are doing fantastic work within the regions and the districts. But if you come to the operational unit, go to the airport, they are there. Go to Temahabo, your things arrive and you are clearing and they will stop and say, give them money. And nobody seems to be in control. They are paid on tabletop. And so mine is that, where are we going to with this type of behavior? Behavior, Kojo. Now, I've got to ask you this, because looking at the law, okay, um, the Security and Intelligence Agencies Act, 1996, uh, Act 526, it lays out the structure of national security in Ghana. You're right, there is no place for a force of any kind, but it does lay out uh, the regional and district security councils. And that is where uh, the retired colonels, um, uh, retired DCOP's position falls, okay? So the way it works is that the dis uh, DISEC uh, is under RegSec, and RegSec reports directly to the National Security Council. The National right. Security Council is chaired by the president. Okay, so of all the state institutions, this is perhaps the only one that is, has a council chaired by the president himself. So this individual who was then arrested by Delta Force members reports to the president. Now, this is somebody who has said in the interview with my colleague MFR Pau that he has been working with these boys. He has been working with the Delta Force. A, t a group that we were told has been disbanded. Does this not suggest that our own security apparatus in this case were acting unlawfully? Well, the truth is that, you know, the, the, this whole national security architecture has been bastardized. Bastardized so much so that uh, politicians have hijacked it. You have, you know, called them uh, experienced technocrats experienced intelligence officers who can pass for any FBI interview, any CIA, MI5, MI6. They can, they can do same as their colleagues all over the world. But unfortunately, these guys have been pushed to the back. And you can see the DCOP who was humiliated. I call that any police officer who probably listened to one of his own former bosses 
telling the world that he was handcuffed by people who probably, excuse me to say, probably cannot even write their names. Can't write their names. Probably would be shivering because then if you can handcuff a COP retired who has been appointed, reappointed as a security coordinator, yes, you ask the question. He was condoning an illegality. The truth is that even as he didn't report, maybe those who, those other colleagues of his who are still, who are yet to be handcuffed, I think they should speak up and stop working with these boys. Because the truth is that, and Kojo, I'm sure, you know, when you are senior, general, you are an experienced, you know that they, they, some of these people around the president, excuse me to say, are liars. And so if this man probably wanted to speak to the president, chances are that he might have to go through some of these uh, bottlenecks. And you know, if you take, let's say the US, you take, let me use the UK. These are democracies that we purport to be learning from. The people who provided probably, the civilians who provided security for Joe Biden before he became, he, be, he was elected. The moment he was elected, those people were pushed behind and the state security takes over. But in this country, Kojo, you and I know, it is not that way. The guys who form the inner core, the civilians, call them who play the role in protecting a certain presidential candidate. When he comes into power, if you were the security coordinator, whoever you were at the National Security Secretariat or Ministry, or you have to pass information on to civilians, call them civilians, by, you know, the fact that they were close to the president during his campaign, you have to talk to them before you get to the president. So depending on who you are and how they relate to you, if they don't like you, your information would never get to the president. And so for me, it is a whole conversation we must have. The National Security Secretariat is a monster staring at us. One day, they will throw this country into chaos. If there is going to be any civil unrest in this country, it will not start with probably uh, fix the country. It won't start with these young people who are asking for things to be done. It will start with national security operatives who might shoot at some of these young people, and the young people would mobilize, and those of us, the older folks, we can't control them. And so, you see, uh, a DCOP has been handcuffed, and his own former subordinates have not been able to tell him why, because they are afraid. They should have come to his aid and made sure that these guys who arrested him, these guys who humiliated him, these guys who handcuffed him and cocked a gun at him, assaulted him, are facing prosecution today. And they are walking free. So mine is that, who knows, could be anybody's turn tomorrow. Because a DCOP, I mean, he's no mean a person. You can't equate him to any of these boys. So it is rather unfortunate that we're having this conversation and now uh, respect for the elderly is gone, respect for authority is gone. And these guys are literally undermining the authority of the president. As you narrated, the president is the chairman of the National Security Council. The president is the commander in chief of the Ghana Armed Forces. These are two, two of the most important positions in this country. And the president chairs these positions. If there has to be war, if Ghana has to declare war, Nobody can do that. The president would have to do that in consultation with parliament. And the, but the truth is that is the reason why he's a chairman, he's a commander in chief. So if these boys don't respect the commander in chief, then you should know that your guess, Kojo, is as good as mine. And these issues would never go away. You see the Galamse fight. Now that the soldiers, the professional soldiers are burning the Galamse, uh, you know, mining equipment, uh, I'm sure that they might send, excuse me to say, their stupidity onto the soldiers. And I'm believing that the soldiers would deal with them in a manner that is befitting. Because for me, we've got to deal with national security, this operational unit of Azubu and his people. And these guys don't answer to anybody. They can literally beat anybody up. 
and you don't even know who to talk to. And that is the country we find ourselves, you know, uh, how many years of practicing, you know, uh, democracy in the Fourth Republic for you. Now, of course, there is the concern over the fact that after their arrest, they are reported to have been set free. Now, yeah. <laughs> again, this is just reminiscent of 2017, when pretty much the same group did pretty much the same thing in the same region and ousted the newly appointed regional uh, security coordinator, resulting in their arrest, arraignment before court, and then another group of the same Delta forces came and released them from court. A sacrilege to our judicial system. Now it's the police themselves letting them go. What exactly are we doing wrong here? Why are we unable to deal with criminals as criminals? Hojo, I, I told you that the police is not powerful. The police, they only exist by name. The police is there, let's say myself and you, we get into some fiscals, then the police will come, because we are very ordinary, they will show us that they have the power. But be, between myself and you and viewers, the police is, doesn't have any power in this country. They, they, I mean, they have no power. They've lost every respect that call it uh, police officers all over the world in a democracy like ours should have had. And the simple reason is that if these police officers who arrested these hoodlums who handcuffed one of their retired senior colleague have kept these hoodlums in, in prison or in, in cells, these hoodlums would have gone there, broken down the cell and freed them. You spoke about there are three organs of government and the judiciary is one of them. The judiciary is one of them. If they went to a court where a certain judge who we are told was pregnant, they ransacked the court and I don't know whether she was able to run I don't know. I wasn't there. But we are told that she was heavily pregnant. And yet these guys went there, didn't show her any mercy, didn't show any respect to, you know, that organ of government. We are, I, I am afraid when there are cases in court that uh, judges are trying. I would talk, but you see, I wouldn't dare talk about them because if you joke contempt of court, you will go and serve time in jail. And I don't want to do that. But these guys went to court, freed these guys who were uh, in court, freed them, and what did we see? They were let go. And so if I was a police officer, or if I were a police officer, manning a certain station, and these guys went to handcuff this, uh, our former senior colleague, and these guys were, were brought to my jurisdiction, you know what I'll do? I'll set them free. Because then the truth is that even the courts has lost the kind of respect and the authority it's supposed to have had under the fourth Republican constitution because these guys can literally, who else? I have said that they're only probably, the other places they are yet to go to, uh, might be, I think, Jubilee House, they have tried. Mm. Uh, parliament, yes, probably they will, might, one day would ransack parliament because they don't respect anybody. And the police is afraid of them. They are afraid of them because somebody said that national security and he calls the shots. And so who do they answer to? Nobody. They are paid on table talk. So Kojo, between myself and you, there are about 4,000 of them, or 5,000 or more, of these guys who are paid on table talk. Paid on table talk means that, Kojo, their names are not everywhere. These are not career national intelligence officers. They are not career security operatives. So what it means is that if they wear balaclavas, they cover them, their faces and commit any wrong, if you don't know them, you can't identify them by face or any means, their names don't exist anywhere on, on national security records. Their names only exist by they holding GOTES and holding what you call them ID cards, like I'm a national security officer. Not all of them, amongst the four, five thousand are like that. But I will tell you that majority are in that realm, where they are paid on tabletop, their names don't exist anywhere, they go taking money, extorting money, they go stealing people's gold, and they are doing all sorts of illegal activities. Yet, under our human rights 
lawyer president. We passed a vigilantism law that says that we will punish anyone who is seen to be engaging in vigilantism activities or associated with vigilantism activities or funding vigilantism activities. Could you tell me, hmm. since this law was passed, has anyone ever been convicted? And I raised concerns when these issues came up and I was asked to put in a memo. I said, no, because I know it's going to be a bogus law. And truth be told, I have been, uh, you know, vindicated. Because even uh, Banda, my good friend, who used to be the chairman of the legislative, uh, whatever, in committee in, uh, you know, parliament, he himself was wounded out in his constituency during uh, the primaries of the MPP. And he couldn't do jack. And so mine is that, Kojo, we are sitting on a ticking bomb, and I will call on CSOs, advocates, all of you, we need to come together and let the president know that whilst he's in France, telling us he's going to look for uh, what do you call that, uh, vac you know, vaccines and all that for us to be vaccinated against corona. We have our own COVID in this country that is deadlier than coronavirus. So mind is that if we cannot deal with the operative chamber or the operative organ of the national security, the operational wing of the national security, then we have no business fighting corona because we have our own coronavirus which we don't have a vaccine for. So why do we go looking for vaccine from across the world? So for me, Kojo, it is, it is, it is you know, uh, sad that you have a DCOP. I mean, you ask any police officer, you will start from constable and go on to, you know, DCOP. The last one is COP. Then you get to deputy IGP and IGP. Then this man retires. Then you have these boys who can't write their names. Excuse me to say go to handcuff him, and the police station close by that arrested them, have freed them because they themselves, if they joke, they'll cock guns at them. Why do we have a standby force at the national security? We cannot put persons like uh, uh, Justice, uh, the, 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 the Lady Justice, and put, uh, you know, Emil Short, and put uh, Quateng, former IGP, and all these people together for a four weeks, I mean, for about four weeks, to interrogate what took place under uh, this Ayawa West work on thing. And then uh, the recommendations, most of them were not adhered to. Even those of them that were accepted have not been uh, probably, probably uh, properly implemented. So, Kojo, it is sad, but I am hoping that uh, somehow, you know, all of us, the good people of this country, and I tell you that they are senior people in the MPP who, when you talk to, they share the same concerns. They will tell you that we are afraid that one day these people under Azubu or under the National Security Operations Unit will throw this country into chaos. So uh, let's keep watching, let's keep talking and see. Maybe we can come together and push parliament. Because in all this, what is parliament doing? Even though they're on recess, I'm hoping that uh, when they come, we can push them to ensure that that wing is scrapped so that national security, could you? will perform their core functions of gathering intelligence and ensuring that uh, they don't have a standby force and ensuring that all these petty criminals in town, you know, they bring information for police, immigration, and the rest to deal with. But unfortunately, we've reduced national security to be uh, party, uh, you know, foot soldiers who don't respect anybody, nobody. They don't respect anybody. So that is the, the situation, Koyo. I want to thank you for your time with us. Um, and uh, Adam Bonau, of course, is a security analyst speaking on what many believe to be uh, potentially an existential threat to democracy and the rule of law. And that is the activities of vigilante groups who seem to be uh, ex exercising power over uh, security services. Now, SOS Ghana wants to take on the care of six children who were left orphaned after their parents died in an unusual manner at Idumasa in the Ashanti region. Their father murdered his 38-year-old wife and then committed suicide in that farming community. After Joy News aired the plight of the children uh, when family members called for support, SOS Ghana intervened to cater for their upkeep. Here's a bit more in this report. The six children, five boys and a girl, 
are already missing their parents. A process has started to support the children's upkeep and possibly house them in one of the SOS villages in Kumasi. Programs officer for SOS Children's Village in Kumasi, Bernard Amwako, visited Edumasa to meet the family. Um, after um, visiting the children and assessing the situation that they find themselves in, um, for the next steps, what we want to do is to liaise with the Department of Social Welfare together with the families. We are open to take these children into our facility if that is the best option for them. So together with all stakeholders, we'll make a decision very, very soon, as soon as possible, to be able to offer the best possible care for the six children. The head of the Brito clan of Edumasa, Nana Jeche Amponsa, welcomed the move. He said the family welcomes any help that will improve the future of the children. I agree with any arrangements they will raise to help these kids. They have been offered and any assistance will be well received. We are asking other donors to come and help them. The six children currently live with an uncle who has four children already. Reporting for Joy News, Erastus Asaredonko, Kumasi. You're welcome back. Now, forestry, agriculture and food systems are deeply connected with economies, cultures, health, climate and the environment. Hence the impact of the forestry and agricultural sectors are uniquely placed to contribute to majority of the sustainable development goals. Now, at the same time, the forestry and agriculture sectors in Ghana continue to face pressures limiting their capacity to maximize their contribution to a growing population while coping with the climate change and the degradation of the natural resources, including soil depletion and biodiversity loss. So how do we ensure that policies are formulated to protect livelihoods of forest and farm producers, especially women? Today on The Pulse, uh, we're going to discuss the work of the Ghana Federation of Forest and Farm Producers in partnership with the Peasant Farmers Association of Ghana. Here with us, uh, Mr. Benjamin Kwejo Safo uh, is a project officer at the Peasant Farmers Association of Ghana. Mr. Safo, it's good to see you. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. And good afternoon to your listeners. And I also greet all farmers and smallholder forest and farm producers across Ghana. Perhaps we should begin from the Federation. Tell us about it. What's the aim of it and uh, who, who participates in it? Sure. So um, the Ghana Federation of Forest and Farm Producers is a national federation of FFPOs. When I mention FFPOs, I'm talking about the forest and farm producer organizations across the three ecological zones. So GAFA membership is solely drawn from three ecological zones in Ghana. You mentioned the forest, the transition, and the savannah zone. Currently, when we talk about GAFAP, we made up of 12 membership, and these are made up of all organizations which are vibrant in these ecological zones, as I did mention. So the Peasant Farmers Association of Ghana doubles as the APES, or the National Coordinating Organization. At the Forest Zone, you can mention vibrant organizations like the Kuyapa Koko, the Koko Pa Farmers Association. We have ASP Krima. We also have PADU, that is the Private Afforestation Development Organization. In the Transitional Zone, we have ABUFA, that is the Abrono Organic Farmers. In the Savannah Zone, you talk of Terebere, you talk of Zofa, Keda, Tuodep, and Kamala. Kambaku as well. So these are all vibrant forest and farm producer organizations which through their influence and the matter of building synergies came together with the mindset of building their strength in numbers to shape national policies in the interest of smallholder forest and farm producers. Okay, so, so what's the objective? I mean, what is the problem that you're seeking to solve with the you know, uh, formulation of policy? Sure. So with the with relation to forest and farm producer, it doubles as the smallholder farmers mantra that we always talk about 
when we mention agriculture as a sector in Ghana. We already know that there have been a lot of policies from the government, notably that is the planty for food and jobs, which is a welcoming idea by smallholder farmers, especially if we want to consider the pillars government tell, although we have some concerns with it. But there are other some key pillars that we think the government could have added, of which includes the irrigation section, issues of risk mitigation, especially bushfire prevention, issues of flood, which always do happen, and also issues of access to credit. These are all problems that our farmers are facing. So the GAFAP, through the willingness of these organizational leaders and the membership at the grassroots, came together to push a common agenda, a common goal, something that usually we don't see, people coming together. Because when you come to Ghana, we have a lot of association which push for a common goal. So these federation represent farmers, and the voices of farmers are heard through a national association. So these problems are what we are always still on to solve. Right, so you've got a national dialogue coming up, as I understand it. Uh, tell us about it, that. Yes, so one of the two that GAFAP is employing to solve our issues is bringing together stakeholders on the table to dialogue and see how best some of these challenges I did mention of will be solved. Notably among us is the fact that GAFAP have come together with a strategic document, that is the Agenda 2030, which doubles as a 10-year implementation plan for smallholder farmers, which includes sustainable transformation, that is the financial transformation of our members, issues about the landscape restoration, and also issues of the GAFAP green market. Because one thing that we've realized is marketing as a key challenge of farmers when it comes to uh, Ghana and even the sub region. So one of our key initiatives is to use the tool of a dialogue to bring stakeholders together from the development side, from the um, other donor partners, from the farmers themselves, from government institutions, to come together so that we tailor to them the issues that we enhance at the grassroots level in terms of our challenges. Then we all develop a farmer-driven action plan to see how best these challenges will be solved. Right. So when and where is it happening? Sure, so for uh, the second edition of the GAFAP National Dialogue Series, Thursday, this coming Thursday, 20th May, at the Golden Tulip Hotel, Accra. We're hosting this program there, and we've invited the Minister, Natural Resources, uh, the Lands and Natural Resource Minister is coming. The UN Resident Coordinator is invited, MOFA and other government institutions, as well as the FAO Ghana, FAO Regional Office, and all farmers are also invited, as well as our media partners. So we want to use this as a tool to bring together these stakeholders in championing our welfare as smallholder forest and farm producers. Right. So, I mean, speaking for all of these groups, what would be that one thing that you want people to take away from this conversation? So one key thing that we want to put across is that, one, it's very important for farmers to build strength in numbers. When we build strength in numbers, our voices will be heard because farmers have been complaining a lot, difficult for us to be heard. How best can then we come together? So GAFAP then represents the voices of the farmers, meeting stakeholders and turn out our issues. And also, what best can we do as farmers? Bringing actions which are demand-driven from the farmer side. That is why the Agenda 2030 seeks to achieve. Here, not technocrats developing it for us, but well, farmers who really understand the state of farming mm -hmm. coming together to develop these plans so that going forward, the actions and things to be done are all farmer-centered rather than stakeholder and technocrat-centered. So this is what farming is going in the right direction going forward from hence. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Benjamin Kojo Safo, uh, project officer for the Peasant Farmers Association of Ghana. I want to thank you very much for making the time to be here. With thank us you very for much. This all important conversation. Now, to other stories. Now, the Ochihini Osaji for Amwiti of Uripinin says even though it is not pleasant seeing excavators burnt, it may well serve as a punitive measure to deal with the Galamse menace. He said efforts of the Ochiman Environmental Task Force have yielded. Some results, Ochehini says, the Birim River is gradually coming back to normal since the Environmental Task Force started its operations in Chibi and environs. Me say, who saw TV now say, my CMB will be a cotton, she needed that tumor. 
ye Now, Ghana's land management system is saddled with complex lapses which have led to the creation of a monster enterprise popularly known as Landguardism. Now, in our latest hotline documentary, my colleague Latif Idris explores how the new Land Act could help sanitize a system that has fueled family and clan conflicts and led to the killing of many prospective landowners. Latif Idris has the precursor. Everybody knows these criminals are called landguards. They are doing it with the support of the police divisional commander, ACPJ. In this area, we call him the landguards commander. Because we have documents to show that chief sold the land to what? This is Kaswa, and this part of town is called Peace Town. But I tell you what, there is nothing peaceful about this town. If there is ever a safe haven for land guards and land guardism, this is it. 29th March, and uh, the boy say, "Yeah, Juma, I will fear her." Now your friend is saying, "Grophobia, Babaji, Omaniyama." The date was March 29, 2021, when laborers working on my project, which you see now in ruins called to complain to me that marked men on motorbikes had come to prevent them from working and then subsequently demolished the building. According to my tenant, I said, I said, I said, I I but woman, woman, I'm all catching so many I cry, and I'm so many caught inside. I'm the one. Langar the phobia breeding in a no a yeni pa when the phobia almost keep you. The langars are giving us a hard time here in Kaswa Peace Town, and we know there are powerful people behind who are even making the work of the crime officer almost impossible. Now the law says, if you unlawfully you know, exercise control or supervision of a land. That is, you don't own it. You don't have what we call interest in that land. In law, when we say interest in land, it will connote what I may loosely use as ownership. And then you try to exercise control. You try to exercise supervision. If you sought to do that, then you will be in trouble. And by also doing that, seeking to prevent a developer, somebody who has acquired interest properly in the land, seeking to prevent them from developing their land, then now the law says you are in trouble. You could be going to jail for between 5 to 15 years. Custodial. There's no option of you being fined or being cautioned. That's, 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 and that for me is very good, will bring some sanity. If you, 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 you conducted yourself in using force and acts of violence to intimidate, 
to, as it were, obstruct someone who has acquired the land properly from being able to develop that land, you, upon conviction, will be looking to go to jail minimum five years, but there's a maximum sentence of 15 years. There's no room for a fine. So that's airing tonight at 8.30, and uh, you can catch it repeated again uh, tomorrow night. Make sure you make a date. That's uh, Latifi Dries' uh, production of a hotline documentary. There's more to come on The Pulse. Stay with us. We're back after these. Everybody know these criminals are called Langas. They are doing it with the support of the police divisional commander ACPJ. In this area, we call him the Langas command. Because we have documents to show that chief sold the land to us. From generations before this age, men and women have fought battles over land. Nations, communities, and people have fought bloody battles of conquest to rule over territories. Today in Ghana, land ownership and issues of litigation remain one of the critical causes of violence in our communities, towns, and villages. To own and use a piece of land, particularly in the national capital of Accra, might cost you more than just money. It might cost you your very life. Right, the Ghana Health Service is asking Ghanaians to take active part in second dose of COVID-19 vaccine as one of the safest and surest means to prevent COVID-19 related deaths and hospitalization. Authorities insist the AstraZeneca vaccine is not only safe but good for Ghanaians after no serious adverse effects were recorded following the first dose of immunization. Asante Regional Health Director Emmanuel Tinkrang tells the media no serious adverse effects like blood clotting have been associated with AstraZeneca vaccines in the region. Ashanti Regional Health Director Dr. Emmanuel Tinkrang tells the media no serious adverse effects such as blood clotting has been associated with the AstraZeneca vaccine in the region. In Ghana here, all the AEFIs that we've recorded, we've not recorded any as far as I'm concerned in Ashanti region, any blood clot issues. Most of them were fever, bodily pains, and others. Uh -huh. So this is the major AEFIs that were recorded. Those that even died, it was more like incidental death than attributable to the vaccine. So, so far, that is the situation in Ghana. But one thing is that I, I talked to you about what this idiosyncrasy that I'm talking about. It varies from individual to what? Individual. It varies from race to race. It varies from even ethnicity to ethnicity. So what is happening in other countries, you cannot use it to attribute to this country. So we, what we have done in Ghana is that we have a Food and Drugs Authority, and we also we have what we call the Pharmacovigilance Unit. That is taking data on all the AEFIs. So eventually all of them will be analyzed, and then we will come out with what we call Ghana's situation. That is better. So let us use Ghana's situation better than what is happening in uh, other countries. The AstraZeneca vaccine is effective and is good for us because of the temperature. The assurance comes as the Ashanti region takes delivery of 153,000 doses of AstraZeneca vaccines. The region has cumulatively recorded 15,000 568 COVID-19 cases with 253 deaths. With 15,280 recoveries, the region currently has 35 active cases, with 11 of them recorded in the Kumasi metropolis. 
250,000 people took the first job in the Ashanti region alone. Though the figure falls short of the required 250,000 doses, health authorities say only those who took the job between March 2 and 9 will take part in this week's exercise. Even then, only those who present with their vaccination ID cards will be allowed to take the dose as officials insist on no vaccination card, no vaccine policy. Dr. Tinkran explains. The vaccination will start on the 19th, Wednesday 19th. And it will cover all people who were vaccinated during the first dose, 2nd March to 9th March. So, if you were vaccinated between 2nd March to 9th March, it means that you are due for your second dose vaccination. And wherever you are located, try as much as possible to go to the facility where you were given the first dose so as to have your second dose. The data has been provided to this facility, so when you go, you will be identified. You will have to go with your vaccination card. Without your vaccination card, you will not be immunized because your special ID is on the card. And that is what we can retrieve so as to give you the second dose. From Kumasi, for Joy News, I'm Interia reporting. Meanwhile, in the Greater Accra region, the Director of Health, Dr. Charity Sapong, says all persons eligible for the second dose of vaccination can walk to any centre to have their own, regardless of where they took the first one. Uh, Madam Charity Sapong has been giving details of the impending rollout of the second vaccination to begin on Wednesday. We are available within all the 25 districts that took part in the first phase of the, uh, of the vaccination in which we saw, you know, these 25 districts all participating. So it's going to be the same thing. But this time, if you took your vaccine between the 2nd of March and 9th of March, then you are eligible for the second dose of vaccination that is taking place on the, from 19th to 26th. If you are eligible, any of the days between 19th and the 26th, you can go to any of the recognized uh, vaccination centers which we have set up and when you go, you'll be vaccinated. The one important thing that we want everybody to know is that when you are going, take your card that you were given the first time when you had the first dose. This card will be collected by the health officials and you'll be given a new card after the second dose. This new card has certain um, peculiar features like the QR code, it's um, already embossed in the new card. And then also a hologram will be affixed to the new card. All these things make it more authentic and if you have to travel or even prove at any occasion that you have really taken your vaccination, it can easily be scanned and all the necessary information will be seen. Right, let's see what's happening with COVID-19 across the country right now. Uh, 27 new cases on record in the last 24 hours. Uh, 1,298 active cases across the country. Uh, that brings the grand total of confirmed cases so far to 93,333, um, of which 91,252 have recovered. Sadly, we've lost 783 lives to COVID-19. All right, let's do some other stories. Now, the chairman of the National Peace Council, Reverend Dr. Ernest Edujimfi, is asking the police to arrest and prosecute individuals involved in the practice of recording insightful comments over the Wesley Girls Senior High School's saga. Uh, according to Reverend Jemfi, some comments on social media could inflame passions, uh, leading a delegation to pay a courtesy call on the national chief imam over the issue. 
The Peace Council Chair observed that the Education Ministry, together with the relevant stakeholders, are drafting a comprehensive MOU to bring lasting solutions to the issue. The MOU, he says, will also capture the rights and privileges of every Ghanaian student. He spoke to my colleague Kwesi Parker Wilson. Well, we've seen all kinds of videos and audios running across the country on social media. And we think that those things are not helpful. They just fuel the situation. We are appealing to all those who are doing that to put a stop to it, give the Peace Council the space to do what we ought to do to bring peace to this country. Do you think the security must act on this? Well, when it borders on security, they have a responsibility. But uh, for some of them, we think that they are just uh, people who are overzealous, over passionate about it. We agree that it could destabilize the country. Yes, we have met. It could inflame passion as well. We have met with some of them. Okay. Yeah, the first video that came, we met with the, the gentleman involved. Yeah. Uh, we had a three and a half hour meeting with him. See. And we've discussed all the issues about the content of that video and its implications to the general public. And so those things have been done. Uh, certain steps are being taken at the background to deal with all those issues so that we can tone down the tension in the country. But the security should clearly crack the grip on those who does that. Well, some of them, I think that the security might have to come in because we have seen, heard the original audio tape, which has now been doctored with a video composition where pictures said, you wonder who is doing this? Some of them are old things that came out. One of them that I heard yesterday, it originated in 2019 when the issue of the airport takeover came up. That was when that audio tape thing came up. And yesterday, I saw a caption that Christian Council speaks against the Turkish embassy, big headlines, but this is not a recent issue. So people are bringing all kinds of things from outside into this matter. And that is what the country must be cautious of, that we don't allow these individuals to knock our heads together and create confusion in our country. Now, on his part, the National Chief Imam, Sheikh Osman Nuhus Sharabutu, is urging the public to eschew acts which could breach the peace of the country. Uh, let's remember, Ghana, God has been gracious to us by the peace he has given to us. And that he didn't, made us, he didn't make us other nations, other nations, but he made us Ghanaians. We, practitioners of different faiths, are able to live in peace and harmony. But our origin can be traced from two people, our two human progenitors, Adam and Eve. And then we were also made into races and, and tribes. Uh, this diversity that God created, is it that he wants us to come and be engulfed in conflicts amongst ourselves? And now to the National Science and Maths Quiz. Contestants from Archbishop Portugal Senior High School say although they have qualified for the National Science and Maths Quiz Championship, they are not satisfied with their 38 points. They say they'll work hard towards the national competition. Ten schools will qualify out of 45 in the ongoing Western and Western North regional qualifiers for the main NSMQ competition in October. Thank you for staying with us on uh, Joy News. I'm Gary Al Smith, and this is the sport that raised for the Champions League today. 
takes our time in this edition. And the simple question is thus. Leicester, Liverpool, Chelsea, who gets in there? And to do that conversation with me is Oreo Kwampa of the Joy Sports team. And he will be with us pretty shortly. Thank you, Oreo, for joining us. Thank you, Gary. Good. So, this weekend, we saw Alisson, with the final kick of the game, blow the race wide open. What did it mean, do you think, for Liverpool fans that you sampled on the street and, you know, via social media as well? I think that was a very important goal because uh, mathematically, although it's still not in Liverpool's, Liverpool's hands in terms of whether they qualify for the Champions League, theoretically, it still puts it within their hands because Leicester and Chelsea both have to meet. And, you know, three points separate them from Leicester and just one point separates them from Chelsea and fourth. Uh, razor edge, razor thing. There's going to be a lot of drama in the final days of the Premier League. We say the Ghana Premier League is competitive, La Liga is competitive, but the Premier League is also up there to watch in terms of the top four race. And that's it for the sport for now. And Gary Al Smith, I'll be back later to do more when we come with Join News Prime in a couple of hours. Well, that's where we draw the curtain on today's edition of The Pulse. I'm so glad you could join us, uh, but it doesn't end here. Why don't you make your way across to myjoyonline.com where news never stops. All the biggest stories are right there for your perusal. Check them out and stay with this station for the duration. Coming up next is Let's Talk Showbiz. It's a beautiful day and you are welcome to Let's Talk Showbiz here on the Joy News channel. I'm really excited because I had a good weekend. And well, I get to ask you if you did too, but um, um, really, <laughs> I hope you had a good weekend too. My name is Doreen Avi and of course over the weekend a lot of things happened. My colleague Ibi was moving from one place to the other and uh, well he's brought us some exclusive interviews with great personalities and I'm here to share with you some of the exciting events that also happened over the weekend. Don't move an inch. <music> If you're just tuning in, this is Let's Talk Showbiz. And well, 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 this is where I bring you all the exclusives. Hmm. So now let's start with last Saturday where rapper Ochiame Kwame and his wife Anika launched their first book. Yes, a book titled Love Lockdown. And well, it was in two sessions, got lots of personalities in attendance and his colleague celebrities. I was there, my colleague Ivy was there. And when we talk of love, you should know that this is the definition of love. I mean, a lot of people commended the actor, but of course, I'm sure we're all asking questions because it's not the usual thing for, you know, a musician to, you know, put a book together. Usually it's more of music, you know, but this time it had to do with a book. And well, Ochiame Kwame and his wife spoke about what inspired them. Now, remember, whatever you put on social media, people are watching and people will ask you questions based on what you put out there. And I guess that is what has materialized into this beautiful book that is out there. Well, let me leave it for the couple to actually tell us what inspired everything about the book, Love Locked Down. Why are you interested in posting our lives on social media? And then sometimes I will post it more and I will post it. <laughs> Now, what came out of these postings was that people started DMing her, especially ladies who were in uh, marriages, young girls who were growing up in uh, broken homes, and uh, young students started talking to her in her DM, in her private message, trying to find out if what we had was real. So they used to ask questions like, so do you fight? They tell, me, they tell us that marriage is difficult. They tell us that marriage is impossible. They say that in the marriage, that no matter what happens, the man dominates the woman. And so as they started asking her these questions, and sometimes she will bring them to me and say, look at what you have brought. You go and answer these people. So we will take their phone numbers, give them for sometimes to talk to some of them for hours, especially women who call from England. And so about four years ago, we decided that why don't we put all these ideas in the book? Because 
like every other species of um, animals, we fight for the right to eat, we fight over what to eat, we fight over where to learn, we fight over everything. And just as us, just like us, we also fight. But then we realize that the ability to become a human being is just simple, is to be able to rise above these natural fights so that as a human being, you will be able to solve your complex Congratulations. Ocho. Thank you. So we just finished the first one. Mm. Yes, we are waiting for the second one. Well, first off, why are you doing two separate launches? Because, you know, because of COVID-19 protocols, mm. we're we are trying to meet 150 people for the launch. We wanted to divide them into two, have 50 for one and then 100 for the other. So that's why we said so that they, we could do the whole COVID-19 okay. protocols. Protocol, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm envisaging a lot of youth are going to come because one one question I asked Mrs. Uh, uh, Nsia Ape was, your lives on social media is already an inspiration to people. Why really? are they booked to it? Because we wanted to, we wanted to tell the story properly we wanted to document it, and then we also wanted a lot of the young people who want peer review, who want to, to have the opinion of people their age, you know, to be able to assess a document that they can reference, you know. So we wrote the book, not because we are experts in this area, but because we think that we can inspire young people to love holistically. Was it the out outcome you expected? And so much, well, like, I, it's uh, over exceeded my expectation. Everyone we invited came through, they supported, they bought the books. We are very happy. Your life on social media already is an inspiration for a lot of people. I mean, why go further to add, add a book? Well, you know, um, the, the, it doesn't hurt to give more inspiration, if that is what it is. But then... Um, this book was inspired by the fact that we got a lot of people asking us if our marriage was real, if um, we were very happy, like my husband shows on social media, etc. And then initially it was very worrying for me to think that that was the case, the questions that came, because I understood that you could not want to put your dirty laundry out there. But then what was very shocking for me that people th thought you could fake happiness. But then after a series of DMs, I realized that it was a real thing that was happening. So Kwame and I thought, instead of answering people individually, why don't we put together our life experiences together in a book? It is not perfection but it is who we are. And so if you get our book, you'll see how we li live our lives, how we solve our problems. And if it is inspirational for you, you can draw from it and also do the same thing. Right, so that was rapper Chiame Kwame and his beautiful wife, Anika. And well, they just told us what inspired the book, Love Lockdown. But of course, looking at the personalities that came in attendance, uh, well, my colleague, I be caught up with Professor Kojo Yanka, and guess what? <laughs> I know for most of us, that, that was what we were all thinking, that once he's a musician, the book was going to be all about music and maybe instruments and all of that. And that was what he was thinking. But it looks like everything changed once he read the book. And here's what he had to say. Certainly, and beyond it. Okay. Yeah, beyond it because it's not... And a lot of musicians who write books. Secondly, the cover or the title uh, raised my, you know, anxiety a bit. What is lockdown love? You know, that kind of thing. Um, but because of the kind of background of a chairman that I have known, being uh, he sent messages. He's a very thoughtful artist. Uh, he chooses his words very well. And so I said, let me read this book. And so, of course, he asked me to read it and then uh, for this occasion. So I did, my wife also did. We shared the same opinion that this was very well written, a thoughtful, carefully crafted book. Um, he has a message that a lot of young people would want to know. 
because the current um, crisis in the world makes it difficult for a lot of young people to make up their minds going into relationships. And I think he's provided all the solutions that most young people particularly would like to, uh, to have. And so he's done a great, he's done a great job. When you, when you were told that Ochami Kwame says he was writing a book, or when you heard that a musician is writing a book, most of Ochami Kwame, what was the first thing that crossed your mind? I tell you that I was prompted to be very curious about what is he going to write about. Well, it could have been his autobiography, which is still fine. But to choose an emotional part of a human being, you know, to put all your thoughts together with your wife. I think it's, it has, it, it deserves so much credit. How many people write even their autobiograph autobiographies with their spouses? It doesn't happen. But to have that kind of courage to ask your spouse, let's put all we share in life into this. I think he deserves a lot of praise. Right, so that was Professor Kojo Iyanka on Ochiame Kwame and of course his wife Anika. And now to Kofi Chiame who happens to be the other half of Den Achiame. Uh, well, they are still brothers, they are still friends, everything is still cool. He was also in attendance. But you know, there's this perception that Musicians are mostly people who are school dropouts. But Kofi Chiami seems to have a, a different perception about all of this. He's actually letting us know that it is no more like that. And maybe the things that we thought of the past is not the same at the moment. And hence, maybe things like Kochiami Kwame putting a book together with his wife and maybe a few other things that are yet to come out from musicians, which we are to respect. Well, let's hear from Kofi Chiami the book I no no I haven't but I can pretty much tell what is inside that book because I know the people that wrote the book <laughs> and you know the stories <laughs> I am behind the scenes you, you know what I mean you know the everyday life that actually gets together to form the book I'm privy to that so <laughs> I mean to have thought that I mean a musician who people or society have sidelined that people who don't want don't like education, they don't have a lot of things with reading to, to have written the book. What, what, what volumes of information will this take to the, will this speak to the society about musicians? Okay, so first off, let me just clarify something that, that um, old day musician who did not have anything like the society would expect in relation to, you know, grabbing knowledge and, you know, getting certificates for grabbing knowledge and everything. There, there's been a huge metamorphosis. These days, the people making the records and the kind of knowledge they're spewing in the records, you can tell that this is intellect at play. So the times have changed. Um, there's been, there's a new musician out there who is doing much more than, you know, uh, people would expect of musicians. It's not a job for dropouts anymore is for is is for learned people who are churning out what is right for society this book um it's not going to be short of anything spectacular in the sense that it is a life which is lived um one of the major problems i have with our education system is we're reading about things that were experienced by people in the past in a certain day and age and it almost becomes a little obsolete when you're trying to get that information comparing that we're living in this computer age where things are much more faster than in the 80s, the 70s, or the 60s. So this book opens up love in a new light that people probably are not uh, taking a second look at. Or their, their, their information about love is from what their parents have handed to them or the experiences that they've been privy to in, in their communities, you know, the settlings around them this one and the wife fighting and you know the little things that you read but this is a couple who are using themselves as an example that in this day modern day marriages amidst the social media chaos and all of it 
love can still be locked down and still see the goodness of the day. Right, so there you go, and I hope you had a good time listening to all these, I mean, should I say, great people here on Let's Talk Showbiz. We are back here same time here on the Joy News channel. Until then, a very big thank you to you, Ike, Beverly, and IB. You guys are amazing, and to our sweet cameraman as well. <laughs> I'll catch your name another time. <laughs> my name is Doreen Avio. You can also go on my 